I think it's become the subject actually for my writing. You know, one of my earlier books, my first non-fiction book, was uh, called Blocks, and that was all about what blocks creativity. My second uh, non-fiction book was called The Art and Science of Libel Moments, and that was a deconstruction and exploration as to where how do we tap into creativity. And then since then, I've just gone on a, on a journey, um, actually really trying to explain, help people tap into their creative muse. For a while, I became a, an author's mentor, became an expert at clearing writer's blocks. I've got a few tools to help with that. I did some therapy. And so... I guess it's you know the idea of meta where you go above and beyond. So I'm not just using creativity; I'm exploring it, um, how we tap into it, how we get into the flow, what do we do when we when we we're not into it. And I guess if you look at my life's work, um, not just the books, but all the meditations, have become tools to allow everyone else to to follow that lead. The book on libel moments. I created a, a very simple acronym, which is I D E A, which stands for idea. And the idea there was that we have, um, my, my terms are slightly different. They map into the four elements um, and to the, into the, the four um, suites of the, of the minor arcana. Uh, and I see the world as, as, as having these four stages, slightly different from that one. But the idea of incubation of the idea, the idea of I then go to a point of dreaming what you can do with it, all the spin-offs of where you can take it. Uh, and then to take it into the I go to the evaluation, evaluation stage third, and then the action stage um, fourth. And also I've uh, found out how we can map that into the moon phase as well. So each quarter phase of the moon, our consciousness is more tuned to each of those four steps. So if you've got a project which has got um, a, a time constant of about a month or a month, as I could call it, then uh, tuning into using those four phases over each phase of the moon is a really good thing to do. And, and also we can then map those into the seasons of the year. So if you've got a project which lasts for a year, you can go into those phases of, of uh, uh, and, and those steps as well. And I find that really, really useful. So I, I kind of agree with it, slightly different model, but it's kind of the same. Think of creativity as a slightly different force um, than perhaps it's seen because I, I was uh, attuned to uh, Reiki energy, uh, must be uh, nearly 18 years ago. And the Reiki energy, which is a healing energy, is the same energy, which is the creative force. It comes from the same source. It acts on our neurology in the same way. So if you were to just be creative every single day, what you're doing is actually bringing in healing energy. So it helps you keep, uh, helps you live well for longer. And then it's just a bit of a bonus if that's got um, a spin-off. I always say that if, if one of my books just changes one person and helps one person have a better life, then it was worth worth writing it. And if that one person was me, then, you know, who's to say that there's anything wrong with that? So I believe um, that actually tapping into our creative force every single day is something which um, is, is, is essential for us. It keeps us alive. It keeps the energy flowing. Uh, there's a theory that it also delays the onset of age-related diseases, uh, dementia and that sort of thing. So um, uh, why not? And uh, we should always, if we don't do it every day, we should at least have a creative date every week, which is, I think, something that, um, has, uh, who's the, the lady, um, I can't remember now, the, the lady who does the um, morning pages, Julia, Julia Cameron, yes, you yeah. yeah. reckon it's morning pages, which is that time. Yeah, that's right. Tapping into that creative force every morning, which is the, when I do it, and also having a, a creative date with yourself uh, every week, which is a, a real treat. I created um, a course uh, on channeling um, several years ago. It's called How to Channel Your Book. And in my definition of channeling is um, not necessarily that you're channeling the angels, the archangels, or the fairies at the bottom of the garden, although I work with many people who do exactly that. Um, for me, channeling is, is getting that conscious mind out of the way and allowing the flow to come through but some people find that whole thing quite onerous uh, you know that the, there's like a weight of responsibility so the very very first meditation in that course deals with the fears that actually uh, you are can tap into this amazing force so i see what happens some people it can get overwhelmed by it it can be too much the floodgates open so in in my uh, teachings and the way i go about the the the, the creative flow safety personal safety is very very important um to me and also um using um i use layers i use um the kind of trojan horse approach so sometimes i don't tell it exactly as it is 
I use metaphor, I use storytelling, I use all other sort of devices um, to make the, uh, the information that comes through me more palatable and more widely accepted. I don't know if that answers the question of why someone might commit suicide. There might be other factors involved with that as well. But, well, there's uh, lots of examples of great authors yeah. committing suicide. You know, Virginia yeah. Woolf is just one famous one. Sure. But, you know, I'm sure we can think of lots of others who've... Amy Winehouse, you know, she was a very creative musician and she committed suicide. And there's lots of other examples of mm -hmm. musicians committing suicide, especially when they're 27 years old. I don't know why that is. Um, so I'm talking about this energy that a lot of creatives seem to, it seems to be destructive rather than creative, you know, so there's that kind of tension between, well, can we say, can we call it cre a creative energy when it can lead to so much self-harm? Yeah, but perhaps some, when you take, talk about people like Amy Winehouse and what have you, it could be the pressure of then of the fame that that brings that actually is, is the destructive force as opposed to the creativity itself. I don't know. I've never worked with anybody uh, that's been that way inclined. But um, uh, I would imagine that there's two elements there. One is the, the weight of responsibility of what you're bringing in from a creative perspective and also then the weight of expectation from your public uh, that is then caused by your art being seen by a, at a wider level. It's quite a balance, I, I do agree. Um, is there an answer to it? I don't know. Um, is uh, is creativity dangerous? I don't think so. I, I think it's actually it's, it, the, the benefits of it far outweigh any of the disadvantages. There's probably many more people that haven't committed suicide than have. You know, people used to associate creatives with insanity, you know, because creatives tend to do things in ways that are considered to be weird or peculiar. You know, they they don't conform and that non-conformity can often be associated with insanity you know we wouldn't call it insanity nowadays but that's you know th that's the label it was given several de decades ago you know we we are kinder in the way we use language but um yeah you'd say a creative person was was mad i think so and and, and support you know so maybe this starts at school you know because uh uh, um, maybe creativity has taken a slightly back step at school because of the, the maybe formal structured education around exams and marks and grades and this sort of stuff. And so, uh, and, and often, I remember when I was at school, um, I had to choose between arts and scientists. Science, I went down the science route. I had to give up music, gave up art, gave up writing. All of those things had to go. Um, and uh, I did an art class myself um, maybe three or four years ago. And the teacher was... Uh, told me something very funny is that when you stop doing art your art freezes at the age you stop doing it so I, I stopped I, I uh, in, in, in my 50s I was drawing like a nine-year-old child which is kind of interesting isn't it so that element of, of creativity froze at that point which is kind of interesting so perhaps school is the answer to to cherish creativity to nurture it to to show how we can do it and of course this has got great business benefits as well it's not just about writing books or creating music you know creativity should be in everything we do in in all levels of society that's for sure yeah but I've, having said that i remember when i was um 30 i picked up um guitar uh having uh having to give up music at the same age and, and learn to read music and play uh, classical guitar to a fairly good level as well so there's there's hope for us all if i can uh, if i can do something like that you know. Well, I think it comes back to education. I come from a reasonably uh, impoverished background. I was one of seven uh, Irish Catholics, um, and we didn't have that much money. Um, but I think what I did have was two very diligent, loving parents. And and so if we've got the situation where um, uh, we might have a situation right now, and that's existed for some time, where people haven't had that uh, that love and care. It would only take two or three generations to bring that back in. So we start at, with the education system, sorting that, that, that out so that this generation that comes through now become the parents of the next generation and so on. Within 20 or 40 years, we can address things like that. And so sometimes it's very difficult to, to, uh, you know, to put your, your finger in the dike when it's leaking, when what you've got to do is really look at the, the foundations that are building everything. On. So for me, I think the solution is to integrate creativity, uh, nurturing, love, all of those sort of slightly tenuous and, and elusive qualities 
in education, embed it in education, and then within the before this de this century is out, we've got end up with a completely different um, situation. Certainly in, in in the Western world. I think one of the key words that you mentioned there is is love. That although you you came from a background where in terms of finance, it might have seemed to be impoverished, but there was a lot of love available and love is an energy. It's a, it's yeah. a force. And so, uh, mm -hmm. but so many people go through their compulsory education where there is no love, you know, they hate going to school. They hate those, you know, the 10 years that they spend almost as though they were in prison, you know, because they're forced to be there mm -hmm. and they end up being in prison. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about it. I love learning. I, I, I perversely I even loved exams because uh, even though we were in this impoverished uh, situation uh, we were really competitive as children so we all tried to outdo each other you know we're, we're great we're taught how to play I think that was it we, you know we um, we were taught, we played games a lot and so when we got into education it was a game to outdo everyone else in terms of exam scores and all this sort of stuff so we were quite a competitive family not in a nasty way we we're very supportive i remember my brother um helping homeschooling me and i did the same to my uh, my siblings as well my younger siblings so we we're very supportive in that in that regard but there was always i guess a healthy competition which is good and that, that to me is also uh, extends now because i work with so many other artists some of the best projects uh, I've been working on. I've just literally, my 16th book is the one that I fully co-authored, where I've actually written it with somebody else. The book before that, um, I co-created with an illustrator. And one thing I do find, which is really lovely, is when you're co-creating with somebody that's got a complementary skill to you, uh, how you, you make one and one make three. And it also gives you that support, you know, the, the concept of the, the, the lonely artist in a garret. Uh, who might have these suicidal tendencies or the I'm not worth it, what, you know, oh, woe is me, uh, who likes my work? And this, uh, now we've got this interconnected world where we can do these lovely Zoom chats and what have you. Um, my illustrator is based in Norway. We've never met and we've been co-creating for over two years now and created some amazing works. And we're now working on a on another project, which is, which is going to take things off to another level as well. And I must mention, there's a fantastic site called Patreon as well, which I, I've... I've, I've signed up to and Patreon actually takes this uh, it, it gives us a way of financially supporting ourselves as artists by taking lots of small contributions from people let's say a dollar a month or something like that and so it, it makes this this idea that the many artists uh, can't make a living out of it but Patreon is absolutely designed to allow writers artists musicians to make a decent living from their work by kind of crowdfunding it if you like co uh, contribution funding it which is lovely i've been i've been doing these uh, daily nuggets of mindfulness for over three years now and then this illustrator approached me uh, two years ago to illustrate them so they become illustrated nuggets of mindfulness and uh, and then before i wrote any of these 16 books i i started writing a novel and that's going to be my 17th book and the way i'm being accountable for that is i'm serializing it through my patreon site so every week two chapters go up which is going to do two things one it gets feedback from people about the book and, and the second is uh, I've got, um, I think, about 10 to 20 chapters yet to write. So it makes me, uh, when I get, when I run out of chapters that I've written, it makes me write the other ones as, as well, which is great. and gives you that mm. great feedback that, um, you know, there's, there's a market for it. Yeah. Meditation is the key. Getting the conscious mind to um, be quiescent, to form a new relationship with your thoughts, uh, to realize that thoughts, um, not all thoughts are necessarily your own. Uh, I would say 90% of thoughts uh, come from outside the, 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 the mind, outside the brain, if you like. And our brains are as much a receiver of thought forms as they are a generator of thought forms. And what meditation does, it doesn't actually mean that you uh, have no thoughts at all, but it just forms a different relationship with your thoughts. And you get to know the difference between that idea, that seed idea that's come from the, 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 the genus of the, the concept, uh, the, the evaluation ideas, the dream ideas, and the action ideas. You get to know the different flavors of thought. If I even wrote, even wrote a book called Flavors of Thought, so daily meditation to me is it. And, and actually, I must say that what's happened to me since I went on this journey, which I want to share, is that if you think you know what you're going to be as an artist, you're limiting yourself completely. So at one point, I thought, oh, I'm going to be um, 
a, an author that helps other authors out. And then I, then my own authorship came in. I became a successful author in its own right. And I started to put meditations alongside my books. And then the med meditations got discovered. And I've now established myself as uh, one of the top meditation guides in the world. And if you told me that's what I was going to do when I wrote that first book, I would have run the other way. And so by not knowing that was on the path, it's actually allowed it to come come forward. And there may be another gener another thing that happens as a result of that, if you know what I mean. So, uh, but the only thing I will say is that I generate something creatively every single day. And also when I'm doing in, in these any, any conversation, any social interaction I have, there's always the theme of creativity coming through you. And my personal belief is that there's an unlimited source. So, um, and, you know, I give away as many ideas as I might use myself. And the more you give away, the more ideas you get coming in. So to me, it's a it's a way of life. It's a modus operandi, and it's a joy and a pleasure. And who would not want to love what they do? When you love what you do, you don't end up working, do you?